Welcome to The Big Rich Show. This podcast will focus on conversations with friends and acquaintances within the four-wheel drive industry. Many of the people that I will be interviewing, you may know the name, you may know some of the history, but let's get in depth with these people and find out what truly makes them a four-wheel drive enthusiast. So now's the time to sit back, grab a cold one, and enjoy our conversation. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two. Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Why should you read Four Low Magazine? Because Four Low Magazine is about your lifestyle, the four-wheel drive adventure lifestyle that we all enjoy. Rock crawling, trail riding, event coverage, vehicle builds, and do-it-yourself tech all in a beautifully presented package. You won't find Four Low on the newsstand rack, so subscribe today and have it delivered to you. All right, on today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, we have Jim Reel with J.E. Reel Drivelines. And Jim is out of Pomona, California, married to his beautiful wife, Cindy. We'll talk all about that in Jim's uh, career and what got him to where he's at now. So, Jim, thank you very much for coming on board with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Let's get right into this and let's talk about where you grew up. Well, I was born in Pomona Hospital, grew up in Montclair, Moved to Downey area briefly, back to Montclair, and, you know, just went to high school there, and, and uh, now I live in Upland, so all right in the same area, other than uh, six months of working in Long Beach for an electrical contractor, and about eight months in uh, Chandler, Arizona for a, a truck electric outfit. It's all been right here in Southern California in the same neighborhood. Wow, that's amazing. When you grew up there in that area, I would imagine it's not it's not near as crowded, overgrown as Southern California is now. No, absolutely not. Where I live in Upland, this was uh, Orange Orchards and two blocks up, we'd unload our motorcycles and ride up in the mountains. Now it's all houses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same kind of story with talking with, uh, with John Curry as well as some others. Yes, yeah. So let's uh, let's talk about those early days of uh, motorcycles and stuff. Did you when did you start riding or when did you start driving? Um, was on a mini bike at about uh, seven years old and six or seven, and uh, you know after that went to a Hadaka one hundred, then a Yamaha two fifty, and then a Yamaha four hundred, and a three ninety Husky. Uh, and some people will notice I limp around and hurt a lot. Well, that was all by 19. I'd pretty much ruined my body motorcycle racing. So, uh, <laughs> not a, not a good move for me. <laughs> no, I understand. And, uh, a lot of our listeners will understand as well. So with, uh, with riding in that area, it was a lot of desert riding trails, that kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot of uh, desert, you know, you know, because we'd go out by Victorville and, and of course, uh, Lucerne in that area. And then, uh, you know, there was just a lot here in the local mountains and foothills. And um, and down in Chino, you could go down there past the dairies, and that was all wide open into the hills. And now it's all houses. Right. Let's, uh, let's talk about, like, high school. Did you uh, participate in any sports or any clubs, or were you a lot like a lot of us where you kind of did your own thing? Pretty much did my own thing. You know, the motorcycles, I tried, uh, went out for football my freshman year, got on the team, and, you know, just decided, you know, three or four practices, I don't know, this ain't for me. I was a car guy, a motorcycle guy, and uh, basketball, football, none of that's ever interested me too much. You like sports that require two balls, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. That, that's, that's a lot of us are that same way. So let's, uh, 
let's talk about uh, school, though. Did you did you take any auto classes or shop classes uh, or anything like that? I, I didn't take any auto shop because I worked for my dad at a diesel truck repair shop from, you know, started sweeping the floors down there when I was young and was learning to do brakes and different things and, you know, rebuild carburetors. And I mean, he did, you know, the big gas engine trucks too, the like rider vans and stuff. And, right. Uh, so, you know, I was learning all that in seventh and eighth grade. And, uh, you know, so I just, took mostly metal shop and welding and uh, took all, all of that I could, you know, uh, two or three uh, hours, uh, you know, uh, get my other classes in and then try to do, you know, two hours of metal shop and uh, things like that, that, you know, I could spend more time doing that stuff than, which I should have spent more time learning grammar and English. That's where I hurt. <laughs> <laughs> But it wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, but then you'd end up like a teacher or something. and you know, Yeah, yeah. My life could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So then uh, from from in high school, did you continue working for your dad? Or where did you split off and, uh, you know, what happened after high school? Uh, after high school, I went to work for a uh, electrical contractor in North Long Beach, you know, supposed to get in the union and have this great electrical job. And then, you know, you found out that only, you know, a hundred a year were hired out of, you know, thousands. So, uh, I did that six months delivering to, you know, the different job sites and then decided, uh, I'd do something else. So I went back to work for my dad and I went out to Chandler, Arizona and worked for Dick's truck electric to learn how to do starters and alternators uh for six seven months eight months something like that then came back and worked for my dad and you know started doing the alternators doing the drive lines uh i'd done a drive line you know a couple of them uh learning when i was like 15 and you know and so i just kept doing more i liked the drive line part a whole lot better than diesel brakes or turning drums or you know that stuff so uh, just kind of naturally ended up there. That's awesome. So you've been you've been in the driveline industry then a, a fairly long time. Almost forty seven years. Forty seven years. Wow. Okay. Not that I was worth a damn at fifteen, but <laughs> <laughs> I get it. So at fifteen, forty seven, that puts you at the, about the same age as me, sixty two, sixty three. Is that correct? Sixty three. Sixty three. I'm just. I'm two weeks away from that magical date. Uh, I about two months past it, so. Oh, okay, so we're real close in age. So well, actually, well, I have four months, I guess, but okay. yeah, yeah, right. close. Did you uh, did you marry your childhood sweetheart? Not exactly. Uh, the uh, there's a whole group of us, fifteen, eighteen of us, that were all friends and ran around. And uh, Cindy, I was too shy. I was not her type. She dated two of my friends in high school, which were both car guys that I set her up with. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the her maiden name was Wilson. Uh, my first wife, Nancy, her maiden name was Wilson. Come to find out after Nancy and I divorced and Cindy and I ran into each other 10 years uh, after school, we were both getting divorced and she never did like Nancy. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of, yeah. And uh, we dated four and a half years, split up for seven uh, through a very long divorce. And he just couldn't take no more. And uh, now we've been back together for 22 or three. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. So kind, kind of a long road to get there, but uh, we're happy. That's excellent. That's excellent. Let's dive into uh, into off road. Okay. You know how did uh, how did your off road passion come about? Uh, just you know from a young age with the mini bikes and motorcycles and you know did the sand rail thing and the quad thing and we had a four by back in you know like eighty two and then you know we went to the sand rail thing for a while and then back into the jeep thing and 
you know, it's just always been, I'd rather go out and do a trail or see scenery than go to the river and go up and down the same river all day. Right. I can understand you know, that. Yeah. Some people love it and it's, it's great, but I don't know. I'd just rather be out in the scenery in a trail. I agree. I agree. I, I love the outdoors and being able to, uh, to enjoy it as much as I can and cover as much ground as I can and in comfort is, is ideal. And that's why I got into four wheel drive. The comfort part's becoming more important. We just bought a new JL. It's time to get out of the CJ. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember the first time that we met? Uh, yes, I do. It was the second event I did at Phoenix, uh, right when the off-road expos were starting and the, they decided to do one in Phoenix. Okay. And so I went out there and did that one and you gave me a couple of videotapes and some paper told me who you were and we talked a little bit. I went home and watched the videos and called you up and said, Hey, I'd like to get involved. So <laughs> that was, I think right after the second Pomona off-road expo. So I don't know how far back that is, you know, but what, 18 years or yeah, it would, yeah, something it was, like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, we met up again at, I think at the top of potato salad Hill in Moab during Easter Jeep safari yeah we sat there one day and uh sat and talked for hours yeah yep let's talk about your business is real close to jason bunches yes with uh, tri-county gear and yes. so you've you guys have probably known each other for quite a while a uh, long time yeah it's been 25 years 30 years okay how about some of the other uh people in the scene down there any of the magazine guys or um yeah um at one time or another probably all of them but you know they've moved around and done different things you lose track of them and uh you know then all of a sudden one will show up payway was in probably eight months ago and oh one of the guys was uh god i can't even remember all the old names now but um, got so many of them I've just lost track of uh, where they've moved away and changed jobs. But uh, every once in a while they pop up or call, and uh, it's good to hear from them. Right. I know that you do a lot of stuff for not just the four-wheel drive side of off-road, but also for, like, the trophy truck guys and, uh, and those the desert scene. Yeah, we do a lot of, uh, a lot of trophy truck, a lot of the – we're probably doing more of the ultra four cars than anybody else. You know, when we, we just enjoy that group of people and what they do. And it's always, you know, challenging to develop something better or stronger for them. Like Randy Slauson wants heat treated, uh, chrome molly tube now that's thicker because he's bending them on the rocks. And, uh, so we're working on that, that, uh, it makes it about 30% more rigid. So it's, uh, it's helping the trophy truck guys were breaking slips and stubs and we uh, developed our own system that, you know, they don't break them no more. Uh, but unfortunately it was very expensive and we found a cheaper part out of Europe now to, to do the same job. But, you know, it's been, it's been fun finding solutions for these guys and, and making the truck work, uh, like Justin Lofton broke three, it meant 400 one year. He put ours on next year and he hasn't broke a driveline since. So uh, it's just, you know, those are gratifying things and, and fun to figure out how to make a better part, you know, help these guys finish and do better. That's, that's great. I didn't know about that, about Justin Lofton. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about JE Real Driveline. So when did you get it started? Um, I bought it in 86, you know, uh, from my dad, when they moved up to Idaho, I, I managed the truck store and all that. And he said he wanted to sell it after four years. I think they moved in 82 and 86, I bought it. And, 
I told them, here's, here's all your brake drums, all your stuff, your Cummins rebuild kits, all I want is driveline. And he said, I'd be out of business in two months. And I said, well, that's because you never focused on it. You just did it as a service. And, you know, so I started building it up from $2,000 a month, roughly, was the average to, you know, what it is today. And it's uh, it's been fun. It's been a good experience. Is that been in that same building that you're at? Yep, it's 100 years old, and the dust just pours out of the walls. <laughs> 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 yeah, same place. Talk about the kind of things that you do there. Um, enlighten our listeners. I don't want you to give away any trade secrets because there's only, you know, I mean, there's a lot of driveline shops, but I consider that there's probably three or four that are truly competitors of yours in our industry. Yeah. So um, I don't want to give any way any trade secrets, but, you know, talk about the process of building a driveline for somebody that has no idea like me. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, you know, people look at it and, and they think, well, it's just a stupid piece of pipe. Um, but you know, the, the U joints are, uh, become better and better every time they develop a better, uh, U joint, you know, it's uh, better material, better construction and design. So they don't break the, the uh, bottom of the post. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's um, a lot of machine work. Uh, what we do is machining a lot of parts to make fit into smaller tubes and things because of the clearance the, the guys want in the Jeeps and the rock crawling. But basically you've got uh, like a Jeep drive line, the double carden joint, excuse me, or often referred to as a CV. Um, and then it it's a, uh, a flange or a yoke and then a H yoke, and then a weld yoke with a stud that holds the gimbal in the middle, and it gets welded into a tube. And then the other end would be the stub shaft with splines, and then the slip yoke and a U joint, okay. which connects to your axle uh, yoke. Um, you know, then when it's put together, you you press them together. Uh, they're about, depending on tube size, anywhere from about three thousandths to ten thousandths press fit there again depending on tube diameter you true it you know dial it in with a dial indicator to get it true um there's a few secrets there i was taught by some old guys that allow us to i think get ours a lot truer uh which helps in the balancing process and and that that would be one of the trade secrets that there's a different way to look at it than just use the dial indicator in a circle <laughs> uh, but uh and you know then you weld it up and then of course it's going to warp so you've got to straighten it and the the funny thing people don't understand about it and when they find out they go well that's really strange when it is warped you will heat the high side to make it worse and so let's say you've got to be under ten thousandths run up and after you weld it, it warps to 30,000. You'll actually take that side up with heat uh, to expand it up to 60, 70,000, 80. Then you cool it faster than you heated it with a air gun and water. Or, or some or have a pump and a hose that just, you know, spill over on it. But that actually works back past center until you can dial it in to where it's 10,000 or under on the tube. Oh, wow. And yeah, so it's, you know, kind of, you're actually going to make it worse to go make it better. And it's, uh, people just can't believe that when they watch it, but you get it all dialed in and stuff. And then you, uh, you know, run it in the balancer and you find out, you know, how many grams uh, to put where uh, there's a strobe and a number that indicates. So then you stop it there and you put a balance weight and you just, it, it's pretty, depending on how much the, the dial indicator moves in the cradles when you're spinning it, tells you how much grams of weight to put. And then, you you know, got to play with it a little here and there occasionally. Um, you know, we had to have one of our machines modified to run 7,000 RPM so we can do some of the trophy truck guys because they're, you know, their demand, most of them, you know, you can balance out, but occasionally you get a guy that just 
it's difficult and you got to run it all the way up to where he's running that motor at seven eight thousand and make it work that yeah. those kind of numbers are crazy yeah and it's not fun to stand by that balancer when it's running that fast <laughs> it's a little spooky <laughs> <laughs> so what uh what's the most popular material to make the tube out of most most of the tubing for common use is, is uh, 1010, 1020 DOM. You know, it's just a mild steel. Uh, the DOM tubing is, you know, supposed to be a seamless tube. And it's not really seamless. There's always a seam, but it's been uh, swedged through much finer and more consistent where a regular seam tube that gets, you know, flash welded when it's rolled up has a... a you know, pretty erratic area in it. Right. Uh, so most of it, you know, is all DOM and it's, uh, you know, just mild steel unless we have need for chrome molly like in a drag car or, you know, we've done some of the chrome molly for the, the trophy trucks and for, uh, you know, KOH and stuff. So what kind of, uh, what kind of speeds, you know, you're saying 7,000 RPM for a trophy truck. Uh, you, you're talking about dragsters, drag cars. What kind of well, RPMs are they hit? They're hitting that or higher, aren't they? Yeah, but the thing with a drag car, normally you can, uh, like most shops are balancing at 32, 3,500. And that normally works well because the drag car only goes, you, you take off, you say, let's say you hit nine grand, you shift. You're only there hardly long enough to know you got there right and then the motor comes down then it comes back up and you shift and then the race is over true the okay. problem the problem comes in where the the longer the tube the bigger the diameter must be so that it doesn't whip like a jumper okay. and you know and i always thought when i was young i learned the hard way i made one too long and uh, it was just for a friend's wife's station wagon. She only took the kids to school, you know, one of those old 66, 64 Chevys. And uh, she went to the grocery store. It never goes over 30 miles an hour. And it had that little two-piece with that teardrop bearing. And so I finally make him one, you know, because he's not going on the highway. And he comes back the next day, and it's broken half. So it was really true. It'll whip in the middle and it'll break. So I never did that again. <laughs> then, I, then I had a tow truck or a water truck guy that manufactures them. Always cheap, wanting to do it cheap, bring one in and want it to be, I think it was 84 inches on three and a half inch tube. I said, can't do it. Explained why he went to El Monte to have it done and said, the guy there will do it. And, and he, and he told me, he goes, you know, I don't need a receipt. I'll just pay you cash. And I said, won't do it. It's, it's going to fly out of the truck. Somebody on the freeway is going to get killed. or 20 car pile up. Don't want to do it. So he, uh, he leaves and gets it done. And he comes back in two days with this eight foot long driver line rolled up in a circle. <laughs> and I asked him, I says, where's uh, the other half? The slip yo. Oh, it's still on the transmission. It's fine. That stub is 11 inches long with four inches of spline. It had to whip over six inches for it to fall apart and hit the road. Wow. So it, they really do. So anyway, the longer you go, bigger the tube diameter. But if you add weight to the middle to go to a thicker wall, you now create that weight in the middle that wants to whip. Um, so the problem normally comes in, like say a trophy truck, across the lake bed. Okay, that's three, four, five, six miles. And he's at sustained speed. So he gets the vibration because the tubes actually start to flex up and down. The drag car only got there long enough that the tube really didn't know it was there and he shifted. Um, so that's where the problem, the difference comes in. Uh, but you know, the drag cars will balance at a higher speed too, just because we can. But typically they don't don't need it. Uh, it's that sustained time that, that that tube starts moving, and uh, they will just shred themselves right in the middle and come apart. Hmm. So, 
let's talk about innovations in drive lines over the years from 86 or so 84 86 um when did what was the biggest innovation that you have seen well probably about that time or a little earlier they came out with the glide coat that blue coating on the the splines okay and you know everybody thought that's just stupid it's plastic it's not going to wear out and when you lube that that will actually last two times longer than steel on steel with the same grease wow so yeah because all of us old timers resisted it thought how stupid you know and it other than if you get sand and, and grit in it that starts tearing it it will last twice as long so that was a really big innovation on on longevity um the u-joints have uh like napco just now came out with uh, their performance series and it's the fourth generation of their upgraded u-joint you know without a grease zerk solid cross and they're cold forged instead of hot forged which makes them stronger um and it just uh the u-joints have come so far because we used to see like an F-250 with lube joints and somebody towing, you know, uh, they'd, they'd be worn out in 70, 80,000 miles. And, and it's people who are lubing them every 3,000 miles and, you know, real, real good about it. Um, we're seeing the new OE type joints with the solid cross and the cold forge joint go uh, common 130, 40, and we've seen some go 200,000. Okay. And being worked hard towing all the time. Uh, so it's just a huge, huge improvement in the U-joints and, and the slips and stuff. Uh, the rest is kind of the same. Okay, interesting. The solid bushing instead of a roller bearing, what's the ideal? Well, the the bushing idea was tried quite a while back. Um and they found that at highway speeds, it doesn't live, it doesn't work. Okay. Um, it works good, uh, like for what Jack does in the, you know, the axles, because if, if you've got a car going 80 miles an hour, the drive line without an overdrive uh, is doing about 3,200 with normal street. Um, 25, 3,000, somewhere in there, maybe a little more. An axle with regular ring and pinion at 80 miles an hour is only going about 600 RPM. Oh, okay. So you can get away with those bushings like in an axle. Um, you, you're not getting, uh, you know, near the, the friction. Well, you're getting more torque load, but you're not getting that high speed friction and heat. Um, and that's, they, yeah, they tried it and thought it would be a simpler way and it didn't work for drive lines. Um, just because of the RPM. I see. And so that it's it being solid on solid. Right. Okay. Right. Then let's, uh, what about the development of, I've always hated CV, Cardian joints that you were talking about. Right. I lost a couple of uh, transfer cases because of those things. Once they started to vibrate, you know, you, you you only had like 100 miles and the front of the yeah. transfer case would break off. Is is there a, a route around that? Not really, because the correct, well, there is with these new, you know, like they're putting in the new JKs and JLs. But the more angle you put on those when we lift them, the weaker they get. So they don't live. The yeah, the cardin joint is something you just have to, like I'll tell people, they'll, they'll uh, uh, you know, ask me, well, gee, we got this and it's got, you know, 20,000, 28,000 on it and it's worn out. My, my original, before I lifted the Jeep and did all that and had to change drive lines, you know, it got 80,000. Well, you were on stock tires, stock gears. You know, you're babying it because you're paying it off. Now you've turned it into a toy, put big tires, big axle, lower gears, and a driveline, a U-joint is made to operate at three degrees angle maximum. 
for longevity. Okay, in an off-road world, when we start lifting them, we're lucky if we get anywhere close to 10. Most of the time, it's closer to, you know, 12, 18. Um, and a double carden joint is made to operate at 6 degrees maximum angle. And there again, in the off-road world, when I asked an engineer, how do I explain this to people, he had told me that, oh, wife coming home, she's opening the door. Uh, he had told me that, let's just make it simple math. He said, if the carden joint is to go six degrees, then you're using them at 18 degrees most of the time on a lifted G. He says, you're asking it to do three times the work. And if our longevity goal was 80 to 100,000 miles for warranty reasons, um, you know, he says, if you're asking it to do three times the work and you only got 30,000 out of it, don't you think that's fair? And I says, well, okay, the math adds up. He says, now think of this. He says, you're not running a 27 inch tire no more. You're running a 40 inch tire. It's not, you know, 28 pounds, it's 90 pounds. He says, then you've put low gears in it. You've got it geared down and you're pushing it up against the wall and putting all that strain on it, making it climb. He says, instead of just roll down the highway, he says, don't you think it's fair that they gave up earlier? And I go, I guess you're right. You know, it, <laughs> you know, when you stop and look at what we asked them to do and what they were designed to do, the more heat, more friction, the higher angle. So. I just tell people, you know, if, you, if it's a toy and it's no longer designed the way the engineers designed it, Chrysler, Ford, Chevy, whoever, you've got to consider the fact that you're abusing it just by driving it down the road because it's at three times the angle it was ever intended. So it's a maintenance item. Maybe once every two years or three years or 20,000 miles to be safe and not break on a trail, you need to pull it out and have it built. The other thing is, is, you know, there's a 1310 joint was designed to run a 64 Falcon six cylinder three on the tree, just a, a passenger car on the highway. A 1350 was designed to run your three quarter ton, your one ton trucks back in the seventies. Uh, they had them earlier than that, but you know, that was common. So. If you, you look at what did a, a CJ weigh, a five or a seven, you know, what was it, a 4,000-pound car, 3,500? Yeah. Okay. I just bought a new JL at 6,100, you know, with the diesel in it, and I believe the, the gas motor's 400 pounds lighter, so you got 5,700. Well, what's a, what's a three-quarter ton F-250 weigh from the 70s? About seven thousand. <laughs> yeah. Six thousand seven. So we get these Jeeps and then we put the big tires, big wheels, lower gears, bigger axles. So what is it when we build it? Seven, eight thousand pounds from the six thousand it started? <laughs> and that's why I tell people you need to run a thirteen fifty. You're you're running a truck, not a car no more. Um, you know, so it's you know, one of the biggest things I see is people, you know, being dissatisfied that they bought a 1310 and it didn't live as long as original. But your Jeep's not original no more. You're, you're asking a lot more. So I try to convey that to them, and some are happy that they understood it and went the right way, and others are back in six months going, you know, why didn't it last? Well, you got 40-inch tires. It's not going to. You ask too much of it. You know, so. So drive lines. One, what I've noticed is that uh, as soon as you dent them or you put them across the rock and kind of put a little crease in them, especially especially a crease that that goes down along the drive line instead of like just around it. Yeah. Really creates a uh, a weak spot. Is that correct? Is because then you're you're putting those rotational forces against yep. one end, and the other end is trying to catch up. Is that why they'll they'll like corkscrew on themselves? Yes. Okay. Yep. They and some sometimes it's just 
Yeah, you can just put a, a dent in it, not even very big, but you just get enough torque and apply enough pressure that the, the wheel didn't want to move and you keep giving it more. And, you know, with higher gears, you start to spin. With our low gears, we just keep creeping up on it harder and harder. You know, sometimes just even a dent's enough to just make it wad up in the middle. And, and I've seen them twist so tight that it's only about two inches long and twist a three-inch tube down to closed before it breaks. Right. So let's talk about how to properly measure for a drive line to get the right measurements, get the right one made. Because I know a lot of people screw this up. Yes, yes. Um, okay, the thing the thing to think about is, you know, where does the drive line bolt up? How does the drive line work? Okay, the drive line works off of the center line of the U joint. Everything pivots from the center, and that arc will either be shorter or longer. So, when you measure, if you, you want to think about how does it hook up, so measure let's say you have a yoke at the transfer case and a yoke at the axle okay the center line of the u-joint is the edge of the yoke where the u-bolt or strap goes on okay so you would measure from edge to edge and the same edge either the two top ones or the two bottom don't start going top to bottom you're creating length that doesn't exist because you want to be as close to the actual center line as you can all right uh, don't measure, people measure down. Well, I measured down to the nut. I measured to the bottom of the cast. Well, different yokes are different height. We don't have that in front of us. But what we do know is where it actually, the U-joint drops into the yoke saddle, that's where it's gonna stop at each end. And if that's 27 inches, that's what we need to know. And same with a flange. It's the face of the flange because you're bolting the part to the face, not off the back, not off the seal. And, and I sadly, you know, you get a lot of these goofy measurements. And it's like, it's got to bolt up here, you know, just like your tire. It's going to go on to the flange with the stud. So if you need to measure, hey, I need a wheel that's, you know, five on five, you, you wouldn't measure, you know, from center line of stud to stud. You don't measure from the inside halfway to the next one, you know. It, right. And I don't know why with driveline people get really, you know, these weird measurements. And it's just basically right where it bolts up, as close to center line as you can stay. Okay. And how do you, uh, say you have that 27-inch driveline. That's what you measure out. But you okay. want it to be a long travel. How do you how do you create that long travel? Well, what what we would need to know is at ride height, what is it? Then at full bump, what is it? And at full droop, what is it? Most people have a hard time getting full bump. Uh, and it's the least critical because normally most of the action is dropping out and coming back to ride. Full bump usually is a lot less. If you get us those measurements and we know that, okay, you need four inches of travel, but we need at least two inches of spline left inside. And we want a half inch of safety at the other end so it doesn't bottom out and crack the transfer case. So that gives us the, you know, the dimensions. We have spline bar up to 12 in, or 24 inches long that we can cut and make different lengths. Um, but most the the common slip yokes are have about four to four and a half inches of movement in them. And, and if the car is set up right, it usually uh, handles that. Very few people need that really long travel anymore. They've gotten better at all the geometry on the suspension and, and making things work properly. So that's keeping more of a constant arc between dropping out and full stuff and full droop? Yeah. Okay. Tell me something about the drive lines I haven't asked about. Oh, let's see. The newest thing, actually, I guess, that I think we're going to see improvements in, or we have to see improvements in, is this new joint. Well, it's not new, but the Rosetta ball and cage type joints that they're starting to use, they're much smoother than a U-joint. But when you get a, a much angle on them, they're weaker. So... Something like RCV needs to be 
built that will uh, handle these. Like right now, we're working on a, a Dodge truck that, you, you know, that just slipped on the spline with a snap ring. It's not even bolted on. And with that Rezepa type joint, it works fine. It's a 2020 Dodge. Uh, and it works fine because there's consistent smoothness where with a U-joint, you get a torque load and unload four times every revolution because of the U-joints. Um, so I think that's going to be where the next biggest improvement comes is uh, working on designing something that, that lets that CV be strong enough to replace the Cardin joint. Okay, so a Rosepa is more like an RCV joint or a Burfield where it has yeah. multiple balls yeah. that ride in a carriage? Yes. Okay. How about with new materials? I know that uh, that the trophy truck guys were trying to go as lightweight as possible, and there was some stuff being done with the carbon fiber. Is yes. That, is that working? That's all experimental stuff we're doing at this time. Uh, we did some carbon fiber with Lauren Healy. Um, what it did was he had told me he was wearing out his gears after one race and replacing them. With the carbon fiber taking the vibration out, he got to uh, four races before wear started showing up. So it's a big help, but the bonding came loose because he's got some heat issues too close to the drive line. Okay. Uh, so we're going to look at that again, but you know, also that carbon fiber has got to be protected a little bit. Um, so we'll be doing more looking at that, but yeah, the, he had heat issues that, that made the bonding come loose. Um, I'm working on some other ideas in carbon fiber to try out with Lauren, but they're supposed to be, kind of quiet and it is is a uh, uh a secret at this time so would, I would won't you go would that. you rather me not talk about carbon fiber then oh no no okay. carbon fiber is fine if there's just something that's not supposed to be out yet i'll just you know we can't go further on it okay um, that's fine that's fair enough <laughs> the, the trophy truck guys i'm looking at doing some carbon fiber and the the neat thing about the carbon fiber is I'm having parts made now where I can, can do it because there's no parts made in that right size. But they run a three and a half inch tube and they're all somewhere at about 39 to 44 inches long. And at 6,200, 6,300 RPM, they all start having vibration issues because they're overrunning the tube diameter and starts whipping. A two and a half inch, well, two inch carbon fiber then measures out because they measure ID on carbon fiber and OD on steel too. Okay. But with a 155 wall thickness, we come up to just under two and a half or two and three eighths. So I'm giving them about an inch of clearance they didn't have. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe we can then run a stinger to protect it. But we're looking at doing some Kevlar wraps on it and when doing that, the carbon fiber will will take the pelting like on a short course uh, truck. It'll take the little rocks, the pelting all day long, just to service it. It'll get little chips in it like uh, your your paint would. And so when you service the drive line, you just put epoxy over it so it doesn't keep flaking. Okay. Um, with the trophy truck, it'll take all that pelting. But if they actually hit a rock and crush the tube and break it, the thing is they would still be out changing a steel tube because they couldn't run it. If they hit that hard, they'd ruin both drive lines. Okay. So we're looking at it, you know, trying to give them an inch of more clearance in the carbon fiber. And then they can maybe run a stinger under there to claim, you know, claim back that inch and protect the drive line. Of, you know, haven't haven't approached anybody with it right now we're just getting all the parts made and then going to start having it tested um 
you know, so hopefully that will work. But the neat thing about the carbon fiber, where they run out at 6,200, that tube, four foot long, okay, then if you put the ends on it, it's a good, you know, foot, uh, 12, 13, 14 inches longer than the steel tube. It goes to 19,000 RPM as its critical speed. Instead wow. Of yeah. So I'm hoping that makes a real game changer. That sounds like it. Is there more give in carbon fiber for like shock load would, when guys yeah. are like hauling ass and all of a sudden the, traction, no traction, traction, no traction? The, the carbon fiber that we're using, we have the choice of four tubes. And there's a complete rigid tube like you'd use for a drift car where you just want it broke loose all the time. Then there's a 10% torsion a 20% and a 30% torsion. So say on a drag car where there's an uneven track and they don't want it to pull so hard to the left, they can put in a drive line that'll give them 10%. If that's not enough, they can put one in that'll give them 20% and maybe that keeps the car straight. <laughs> um, for the short course guys, we want to do some for the uh, those guys because the pros... Pro two, Pro four, their their stuff's pretty big and heavy, and and they you know can hammer it. The Pro light, you know, it's all the same stuff. They're all spec the same, and they've tried to lighten all the parts so much to gain a, an advantage. Some of them are breaking wheels and different things, and the landing on the nine inch Ford you know gear, they're breaking those. Well, if I can give them a twenty percent torsion when they land, they should be able to just keep the throttle on and not worry about. It. So yeah, we're we got a lot of ideas we're playing with, and and unfortunately, uh, it should all come about a good six months, eight months sooner. But my wife had back to back knee replacements, and just now went back to work, and I had to be off quite a bit for therapy and all the other things. So and COVID, and you know, slowed down factories, and yes. so the whole thing kind of got screwed up this year. But we're Actually, the CAD CAM guy's there tomorrow morning, and him and I are going over everything. So we're back in process on it. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. Let's talk some stories. Do you do you still have the? Well, there's there was an old CJ5, like a '52. It's actually the title says Willie's, and I think it's a '52, but it you know it just a, looks like a CJ5. Okay, I thought you had one that had the... Uh, commando? Yeah, the the old... command... that's it, the Commando. Yeah, I had two. I sold one, and one is still at Off-Road Evolution. Uh, and Mel says he's going to get it done for me this year. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. awesome. Yeah, he started on it, and then his business, he just took off. Did His business grew so much, and so we just kind of sidelined it, but it's... It's got king coil overs, uh, a uh, LS1 in it or two, something out of whatever came out of a, um, I forget now, the uh, Escalade. It was like a 2002 Escalade or something. So, okay. but, you know, it's got that in it and the coil overs are, uh, you know, cantilevered in the back so you didn't have to chop the bed up and got a three speed stack in it. When they first came out, we got one of those. Uh, and then the whole thing, you know, he's got the roll cage done, the body all cut. Um, I think he said he's got to do a wiring harness and then he's ready to fire it up. So yeah, I I'm hoping that we finish it this year. Well, great. That'd be, that'd be really cool. So let's, uh, now let's talk about stories about going out wheeling What's your favorite place to go? Um, and who do you go wheeling with? Well, yeah, the last few years, other than I like Moab and I like, I mean, you know, Hurricane uh, Sand Hollow has been Hollow. great yep. last few years. Yeah, uh, that and uh, Rubicon, um, those would be my favorites at this time. I... Uh, want to get out and do uh, do the Ursham. Every time I've set up to do that, something's come up where I can't. 
Uh, but I'm, I'm getting more and more. I think this JL we're going to just set up for overland, two and a half inch lift, 37s. And, you know, I'm getting more where I just like going and seeing, find the old ghost town. You know, if you come across the technical trail like Rubicon, it's capable. But, you know, I'm not sure I got to try and follow some rock buggies anywhere, you know, it, uh, kind of, kind of slowing down. But the last couple of years, um, it's just been, uh, haven't got as much wheeling in, you know, just between Cindy's knee surgeries, uh, you know, grandkids, kids, just things happen that a couple of years have been thrown off and I was in therapy for my hip. And, uh, but so we're looking forward to getting back out and, and doing some wheeling. Um, you know, I've got a couple of local buddies and my son has the Jeep, so we'll go out occasionally, but uh, you know, we're, we're looking to get a little more recreation time and venture out and see some different places. Well, cool. So if people want to get hold of you, what's the best way for, for somebody to, to find you? Um, our website is, it's really simple, real driveline.com. You can get the phone number and everything there. Call us at the shop. Um, you know, the, and the website pretty much has all the information to get a hold of us. And that's R E E L. Yes. Right, like a fishing reel. Yeah, and normally if you if you do R E E L, I we uh, you know got that uh, whatever they call it when you buy up your name or whatever. Oh yeah, your domain, so you got it pointed yeah. to the right one. Okay, good. Yeah, so we we bought that too just because it's like okay, it makes sense, you know. Yes. So what's the future? How many, uh, how many more years are you going to be at the lathe or doing the welding? And uh, is your son posed to take over the business? I think at one time he was, wasn't he? Well, Scott, everybody thinks he's my son, and I do have a son named Scott. Oh, okay. Uh, but Scott's been with me 29 years. Uh, yes, it's for him to take over. Uh, my son, Scott, has worked for me twice. Um, and if, you know, if I thought he would want it and I, you know, but he's not interested, just not my thing, dad, don't want to do it, you know, but he loves going out off-roading and all that. So, you know, I'm probably looking at three to five more years and then I'll probably, you know, help Scott with, uh, stay on like two years as an advisor and go do the shows for him. So till he can organize and get, get everything going for himself. You know, I mean, it's established. It's it, uh, hell. He runs it now. I haven't, I haven't welded a drive line probably in the last two years. <laughs> I just take care of the business part and Scott takes care of the shop. And, and, uh, some, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll stop thinking, why is this done? Why did you do this? Why? And then I go look at, oh, shit, man, he did 12 invoices in the last hour. You know, so <laughs> it's like, hey, leave him alone. He's better without you, you know. <laughs> he, he, does a, he does a good job, so I can't complain. Good. Well, excellent. And uh, Cindy's back to work, so that's good to hear. Yeah. Once she's a little stronger, still got some therapy, but she's able to walk and do well. And, you know, once she's... Uh, you know, back, we'll start getting out again. And, you know, it'll be nice considering this whole year has been kind of strange for all of us. Oh, wow. Tell me about it. I'm, uh, I'm hoping that it's, it looks like everything is starting to get behind us on the curve. Finally. You know, yeah. What did the they two say? Week curve. Yeah. The two week <laughs> curve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, I like the one, uh, the meme that, you know, uh, 2020 is having a birthday. Wait until it turns 21. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's... All right. Well, Jim, thank you so much for taking the time coming on and uh, interviewing and spending some time with uh, me and our listeners. I learned a lot. Well, uh, thank you. And that's that's what this is all about. And hopefully some of our uh, listeners have learned enough to where they can make uh, the correct measurements but I'm going to tell everybody no matter if you think you got it right or not and you've done it a hundred times double check 
those numbers yeah with whoever it is that you're having do your drive lines and there are some people in this industry that have supported the industry for years jim you're one of them and i appreciate that and well, thank uh, you you know there's uh keep everybody out there keep supporting those that support the industry so again jim thank you very much for coming on board well thank you for having me and it was good to talk with you all right and uh we will talk again hopefully we see you at some shows very soon yeah we should be there and uh, it looks like next year will be a better year and we'll all get out again so yep that'll that'd be, be good. awesome okay great thank you all right thank you take care and i'll talk to you later okay bye bye Jim. all right bye if you enjoy these podcasts please give us a rating share some feedback with us via facebook or instagram and share our link among your friends who might be like-minded. Well, that brings this episode to an end. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week with Conversations with Big Rich. Thank you very much.